And of course, we could do stuff like this, right? Because bananas smell like bananas and mint smells like mint. So all we need to do is port that over into bacteria and then we'll have uh, eau de coli. Um, the questions that come up are what language should I use? Uh, what's the cost, the time, or the probability of success? Great. Am I going too fast or too slow, or is this okay? Thank you. So uh, I'll get to the answer to that question, and we've, we've, we've done that project. Um, but, but to s give you a sense of where the world is today, I want to show you maybe about 10 postcards from not from MIT, but from all over the world, just so you can see what people are doing with genetic engineering. So this is a project from Mitsubishi in Japan, where they took the genome of one organism and they moved it into the genome of a second organism, the blue and the red, to make a composite genome. This is a hack. It took them seven years to do this. And the resulting organism doesn't work very well, but it, it is viable. Now, the, the size of the genome that they have is 7.7 million base pairs of DNA. So just about 10 million base pairs of DNA. To put that in context, baker's yeast or brewer's yeast, I still haven't gotten my beer yet. Um, <laughs> uh, that's about 12 million base pairs of DNA. So this is a genetic engineering operation on the scale of, of baker's yeast. So you can begin to think about engineering something as big and as significant and as important as, uh, as baker's and brewer's yeast. Here's a project from France. This one really uh, uh, impressed me. Um, the, human, the human genome was sequenced in 2000, our own DNA. And people have now, you can get that sequence on your computer and you can study it, right? So if you want to reverse engineer stuff, there's a nice thing to reverse engineer, you. Um, and uh, these folks in France found that there was uh, basically genetic fossils, pieces of DNA that appeared to have been inserted in our own genome um, about five million years ago, whatever our ancestors were five million years ago. And these pieces of DNA stopped working. They came from what looks to be a virus, and then they all sort of evolved independently, one from the next. They fell apart in different ways. And so today we have about 20 or 30, I can't remember the exact number, copies of this ancient virus lying dormant in our own genome. What they did is they analyzed the 20 different broken copies and because they were each broken in different spots, they could infer what the ancestral virus was five million years ago. So they reconstructed that, um, and they put that back into tissue culture, meaning a controlled laboratory environment, and that produced a fully infectious human retrovirus. Uh, so it's like the movie Jurassic Park, but without needing to have the physical sample of the amber, if that makes sense, because the information's already inside you. I'll come back to this. Um, Here's a project out of San Francisco where there, has anybody, have, have folks here seen the movie, it's an old movie called Fantastic Voyage, where somebody's sick and so they need to shrink down a submarine and then the submarine goes into the body to fix stuff? Yeah. So the problem, that's a great idea, except the problem is we don't have shrinking rays. And I don't know, maybe there's shrinking rays in the next talk, I don't know. Um, <laughs> But we do have, it turns out, uh, little nanoscale programmable objects called bacteria. And if we could implement some sensors and logic and actuators, then maybe we could program them to go around and fix stuff up. And so that's what this project's doing, trying to get bacteria to specifically target tumors and destroy them. Here's a project out of, out of Pasadena, California, Caltech, where they're implementing logic gates out of pieces of RNA. So they have funny shapes, and they basically turn on or off in response to whatever signal you want. So it's like little molecular switches. Here's a project out of Princeton. Um, these are bacteria growing, and the movie blips a little bit. Basically, these bacteria are running a genetic ring oscillator inside them, a little primitive clock. And the clock is controlling a glowing protein. So when it's noon, the cells are glowing, and when it's 6 p.m. or 1800 or whatever, um, the cells are dark. Um, that was kind of old. I, I like the movie because it spells out sort of MIT, um, <laughs> which is an accident. Here's a, a metabolic engineering project. Metabolic engineering is let's reprogram me metabolism to make chemicals. And here a group at Berkeley is trying to make uh, artemisinic acid for treating malaria um, and grow, grow bacteria to make that instead of harvesting the chemical from wormwood trees. This is, this is the, the logical outgrowth of very early genetic engineering projects such as making insulin in bacteria. 
for treating diabetes as opposed to getting it from pigs. Uh, here's a project, a uh, company out of, out of MIT where they're putting algae uh, in the smokestacks of power plants to capture the carbon dioxide in the presence of sunlight and remove the nitrogen compounds to clean up the gases coming out of power plants. The problems with this are probably not the biology, it's more the implementation of the engineering at scale the reactors and the pipes and stuff like that. Here's a paper, I don't know where this is from, California, Santa Barbara apparently. Um, they added, an, uh, these researchers added a new photoreceptor into mice. So now mice apparently can see in three colors instead of two. Whatever that means uh, to a mouse. <laughs> Here's a project uh, out of uh, Texas in San Francisco. People took bacteria E. coli from the gut, which normally don't respond to light. They added a single photoreceptor. And now when you spread E. coli out on a surface, this is a 10 by 10 centimeter dish, they'll respond to light. Here they're using it to change color in response to light. So you can use this to take a picture. Um, that's Andy Ellington in the biochemistry department at Texas. Well, you know, there's a, there's a film that develops very slowly. It takes about four hours to take a picture. Um, but the cool thing is you get to grow the film and you have about um, 600 million bacteria per square inch. So it's almost gigapixel per square inch. Uh, in this case, you have a Petri dish, which we talked about before, and in the center, there's a signal diffusing. And the bacteria in the Petri dish have band detectors, genetic band detectors programmed into them. And so they differentiate and change colors uh, in space in response to the signal. So you can be in the program pattern formation in space. Here's a project out of Caltech where folks have taken DNA, Paul uh, Rothmund, and figured out how to program it to fold into any arbitrary two-dimensional structure. Uh, within the limits of the, the, the DNA molecule. So you go from squares to happy faces to the world map. And then there are things that we can't do, right? So here's a sponge, uh, I think from the Pacific, a basket sponge, Joanna Eisenberg's now, she's at Bell Labs, she's now at Harvard. And uh, this thing's about 10 centimeters long, and it's a glass uh, basket with very interesting mechanical properties that grows itself. Write down the genetic program that produces this. Don't know. And uh, here's another thing we can't do. This is from the architecture department at MIT. Um, they would like to grow houses, right? So gigantic gourds that grow and differentiate into a four bedroom, two bath house. <laughs> so there's a lot of uh, room for biohacking in the future. Now, um, to contrast this with other engineering disciplines, here I'll, I'll, I'll use uh, civil engineering. Here's a project from around here, France. Uh, where folks over a period of time constructed uh, this artifact, this viaduct, this bridge. And so the thing that's interesting as a, as a would-be engineer of biology is how come the civil engineers get to make stuff like this, yet all I get to do is, you know, sort of add a photoreceptor to E. coli. And so the way to think about this for me uh, is to look at how the civil engineers got to this point, because they started here thousands of years ago, uh, at the beginning of the Stone Age, when they recognized, uh, people recognized, we recognized that rocks are useful, right? You can build walls, but the rocks you find in nature are hard to work with, because they're all different. And so let's start making regular rocks with standard interfaces so that it's easier to build stuff. And even though the basic building blocks become simpler, the artifacts we can make from them become more complicated, like flying buttresses and so on. And so it's easier to make bridges and you name it. Now, later on in the Stone Age, the Stone Age that we live in today, that we inherit, people have already become dissatisfied with rocks. And so we grind up the rocks and we make new synthetic rocks. This is called concrete or reinforced concrete. And that's how you get stuff like this. So the question is, what does the world look like as we begin to invest resources in taking this raw material, which we depend on and is beautiful and improbable and is us ourselves, and try and make it easier to engineer? so that stuff like this becomes uh, not just a dream, but an executable uh, genetic hack. Okay, so two more parts to the talk and then it'll wrap. So here are the three technologies that, thank you so much. Cheers. <laughs> Cheers. See, I don't know any more German, so I can't, thank you. Uh, wait, Danke. all right. Is that right? Okay, so, so here are the technologies that biotechnology is based on over the last 30 years. Recombinant DNA, 
uh, lets you cut and paste pre-existing fragments of DNA. PCR lets you amplify up DNA. And sequencing lets you take a piece of DNA and read it out so you get, you get the letters. The new technologies that are being built out are automated construction, push the button, get the DNA from scratch, and abstraction and standardization, basically a, a, a set of languages that you'll see. So let me talk about each of these very quickly. Automatic construction. So in the left are um, four jars of chemicals. One is the chemical A, the next is T, the next is C, the next is G. These chemicals are derived from sugar cane. Um, you can buy these jars for $250 each. And you plug these jars into a machine called a DNA synthesizer. And then the DNA synthesizer takes information from a computer network and it prints DNA from scratch. So if you've seen Star Trek where they have the food replicators and they sort of, I would like a pumpkin spiced latte or something, and you push the button. <laughs> this, is, um, <laughs> this, is a, this is a matter compiler for genetic material. What's actually frightening for me is I wish I could explain it better, but when I went online to find documentation for DNA synthesizers, it's actually easier to find documentation for how the food replicators in Star Trek work. <laughs> But nevertheless, what this is practically to think about it is a, um, a matter compiler for genetic material. And since the living world that we care about runs on genetic material, this is an important technology to be aware of. And what's very interesting is this technology is getting better very quickly. So on the, on the left of the plot, this is years and then stuff over time. Uh, it's, the left plot is features per chip on, mi on microprocessors. It's Moore's law for computing, a log scale. And then the middle plot is how much DNA we can sequence in a day, if you're just reading out DNA. So in 1990, nobody had sequenced a bacterial genome. In 1995, the first bacterial genome is sequenced. In 2000, five years later, the draft of the human being is, has been, we've been sequenced. So somehow in the 1990s, we go from not being able to sequence anything to being able to sequence people. That's not because the geneticists got 10 billion times smarter in 10 years. It's because the technology for reading out DNA got better. The last plot on the right is how much DNA you can write or compile in DNA synthesizers in a day, going from the information to the material. And that's lagging behind sequencing because our synthesizers aren't very good. You need to make something and then sequence it to find out where the mistakes were so you can fix your synthesizer. Um, but it's going up at least as quickly. And in this year, the, this is an old paper, 2003. In 2007, this is the year where a bacterial uh, genome is reported to have been constructed from scratch, where a uh, mitochondrial genome has been constructed from scratch, a chloroplast genome has been constructed from scratch. So I think this is our 1995 for, for synthesis, meaning in five years, I would be surprised if the construction of bacterial genomes and eu eu eukaryotic chromosomes like yeast isn't a routine process. It's hard to appreciate surfing along an exponential, even though we're all familiar with it from computing. When you see it playing out in biology, it's somewhat astonishing. So for example, to come back to this paper where we engineered a 12,000 base pair fragment of DNA, here's the instructions for how we did it. You could find this freely available online under Creative Commons license. So you can read our instructions. To build the first section, we cloned parts 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, 13, 14, 15, 15, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24 into PSP 104. That's the best technician in my lab working for three and a half months to execute that one sentence. Um, <laughs> we cloned part 11 into PSP 2K3. We cloned each part with its part specifically for acting restriction sites. Blah, blah, blah. You could read the rest. So this paragraph is three and a half years of, of work to make a 12,000 base pair fragment of DNA. This is a project that ran from 2003 to 2004. Um, today, this paragraph gets replaced with the sentence where you ship the sequence information over the, the web and somebody builds it for you. If you type in, you start looking for that online, you'll find lots of companies. Okay, I'll move quickly. Um, most genetic engineering takes place at this level, at the level of machine language. All right, so TAATA, CGA, CTC, ACTATA, GGGAGA. 23 base pair sequence of DNA, which you'll remember is the consensus promoter for the T7 RNA polymerase, an enzyme that turns on transcription of... Um, now, I happen to remember this one sequence because it was my computer password uh, for a while. <laughs> but the problem is there are a lot of sequences like this to memorize, and if one were to program 
DNA at this level, it would be like only programming in machine language, I guess, if I'm using the right analogy. 